Perfect, perfect. Okay, so we are ready to start. Thank you everyone for, uh, we make you wait a little bit, but we want to make sure that everyone is joining us today from different parts of the world. So, um, hello, I'm Farhan from XR Bootcamp. Uh, today we are uh, again with uh, top experts on uh, another topic, which is uh, multiplayer uh, frameworks and networking, game networking um, for VR, uh, mobile, PC, and all the other platforms. And uh, I will give you a quick uh, intro about us, and then I will leave the stage to our expert speakers. So. Um, for those who haven't heard of us, XR Bootcamp, we are a global academy focusing on industry project-based learning, and we have advanced programs, uh, upskilling programs for professionals, and uh, we are creating uh, these programs with the experts that you will also meet some of them today. Uh, we have uh, beginner level programs as well, but today, since it's much more advanced uh, uh, audience, I would like to give you a little bit of uh, uh, idea about what kind of programs that is coming up uh, in the next uh, several weeks. And uh, typically our uh, program is being uh, uh, like, um, uh, we are hosting many different um, companies, uh, professionals, researchers from different universities as well. And they are uh, really happy with our program and they fast track their skills and their experience. These are the um, previous participants to our advanced program. Uh, so in terms of learning paths, the foundations part is for beginners, but for prototyping and uh, the master classes, it is focusing on uh, the existing uh, VR, AR developers uh, as well. And uh, you, our prototyping bootcamp is currently running uh, and um, we will have um, another prototyping bootcamp um, the March next year as well. Um, and in terms of master classes, we have various master classes, including advanced VR interactions, rendering optimization, HoloLens and mixed reality class is coming. So I will uh, give you a little bit uh, detail about each very quickly. But what we are focusing, especially this year and next year, uh, if you are working on a standalone XR device, uh, we define the most pressing uh, and in demand skills and need for the industry. And then we created programs accordingly on these three main pillars. And uh, the, the one that is coming up in a few days is Advanced Fair Interactions, which is actually uh, run by Dennis Kunert and Roger. Uh, Roger is already here. Uh, this is really a class for already existing VR developers who would like to expand their skills. Um, it's an eight week program. Just to give you maybe an idea, we have a very short video. I hope you can hear the sound. viral deep dive. So with this class, we will uh, teach you multiple aspects of hand tracking, but it, if it does a double pinch, a little sphere gets created. So we want to detect a double pinch, how to implement the locomotion system you will do with hand tracking and make it fully interactive and responsive. For example, we will start with like the hand UI to use pinching gesture to expand those part dynamic dot product and how it works and what kind of value you can use to detect those events. So let's have a closer look at the actual implementation. Even if you hold an object now, you actually can still interact with the world, different kind of joints. We will uh, go through them, all of them, and see where they can be used. That piece is defective. Put it in the trash can. Boom. Today is the deep dive with Tom. AI of egg. Principal researcher at Microsoft is with us. Today, we're very, very grateful for Chris, Hannah, and John to be on with us. Freya is, uh, has previously worked as the co-founder of Neat Corp, the studio behind award-winning VR game Budget Cuts. Okay, now we need to make a game. I need to add functionality. And adding functionality usually involves a lot of math. And of course, I need to display them in the language of the game because just showing that there was a sofa in the spaceship will break immersion. Fabric seems to have a hard time 
as soon as we remove the restrictions, all of them react quite nicely. Very interesting little creatures so that you can go to them, grab them, and then dynamically put them back in the trash can. You have the joystick to control the position of the robotic arm. You have a trigger to activate the pincher. So, thank you guys for attending this class and we wish you all well for the future. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, uh, we actually have the next cohort starting next week. So uh, literally tomorrow is our uh, last application day and we have actually an um, a code, a discount code for only today and tomorrow. If you are interested, uh, please uh, reach our team or apply from the website. Our team will actually share the uh, link of the advanced VR interactions class so you can apply directly from the uh, website. So hand physics lab, I'm sure uh, Roger will share more details. I will not go into so much detail, most probably already know hand physics lab. We will also share um, another link about hand physics lab. Um, they actually get, get just being nominated for OGI awards. And uh, if you have time uh, and if you already played hand physics lab, we would love to hear your opinion on, on the vote of OGI awards. So uh, our team already sent both the advanced class, master class uh, brochure and the uh, tweet about this um, voting of OGI awards. And uh, yeah, I have to really go become quick because our team is waiting. So last uh, but last least, uh, we have another class starting on HoloLens and mixed reality. Um, and this is a class being delivered by Stephen Hodgson. I don't know how many of you knows MRTK or XRTK or use it uh, uh, for your own project, but he is the biggest contributor at GitHub uh, on MRTK and XRTK. And he will be the one who will uh, actually have this class. And we are doing that with AWE. Uh, as you know, the event is also approaching. So we would love to see you in that class if you're interested on mixed reality development. So uh, today uh, it is, uh, I think enough for introduction because we really want to hear the real deal, which is the multiplayer frameworks. Uh, I will leave the stage to our um, guest speakers today, but before that, we will also share a few polls during the session. So feel free to um, give your uh, like opinion there. And the second thing, which is very important, we know that you have a lot of questions please submit your question, not through the chat window, but directly use the Q&A tab under your screen, a Zoom screen. Uh, otherwise, it's not easy for us to follow uh, the questions. So I will leave the stage to um, Christoph and Eric, and I will stop sharing. Welcome, Christoph, welcome, Eric and Roger. Thank you. Thanks. So you can share your screen and in the meantime, I will end the poll so we can see the results as well. So is my screen visible, full screen? Yeah, perfect. All right, let's see the poll results. Um, thanks, uh, Fairhan, for, for the kind introduction. Um, pleasure to meet you all. Thanks for having us. So I'm, I'm Chris, founder, CTO over here at Photon Engine. And I have with me um, Eric, one of our senior engineers. And we both will, will guide you through that uh, topic of, of networking, let's say. And we, about the audience, we are not 100% sure. I think we have a, a broad bunch of people from low level to high level. So we try to find the right balance between everything. Um, so feel free to, to ask questions anytime. So we, we, will, uh, we will try to answer everything. And Eric will, um, and, and Roger will pick up the questions and then just chime in. 
um, Roger as well. So it's appreciated if you if you jump in and, and ask us certain things. So otherwise, I would start. Yeah, I definitely start. I mean, again, we know it's a difficult landscape to choose the right networking or multiplayer framework and what to do. And we have investigated some over a year to be looked at the whole landscape. And um, evidently, uh, Christoph and his team has been in the game for developing networking solutions since um, I can think of even knowing that Unity existed. And that's why we think they have a so an incredible knowledge of what networking is and how complicated it is and how to provide like uh, democratizing networking solutions to the broad community, even like smaller studios with not like 50 plus people can actually deliver experiences which connect people, especially in the virtual world to each other. That's why I thought they can basically explain to you what they have looked at, what they decided to, which problems to solve and walk you a little bit through of what you have to consider when you decide to go for a network experience, especially in the VR domain. Um, and we hope you will get a lot of knowledge out of this uh, because it's a little bit confusing because so many solutions are out there and what do they actually provide? What do they not provide? And what would you probably need when you want, want to create a network XR application today? And please ask questions while we go through it. If anything is unclear, we really want to uh, catch everyone, even if you have never done a networking experience, that we can give you those answers. Those two experts we have with us know absolutely everything from the serialization layer up to, you know, networking up to the highest level of the user experience. So please ask questions right away. And Christoph, please go ahead. All right. So we structured the next, let's say, 20 to 30 minutes um, in three parts. So uh, number one or part one is uh, we talk about why net code or networking is, is hard. Let's say we try to make it simple. So that's our claim, but still it's, it's hard and we would like to make clear why it's hard, what are the challenges. Um, then in the second part, we will go into different um, networking topologies. So, um, there, there are different strategies to do networking and all the different tools out there fall in one of those um, topologies. So that's interesting to, to take away for, for everyone. And then in the third part, uh, we talk uh, about KPIs, um, what happens in case you are successful, what are the costs involved? So is multiplayer or, or running multiplayer, ex multiplayer expensive? Um, so we don't talk about a lot of things today, which are super interesting, but would cover a complete session on its own. So we, we skip matchmaking, orchestration, um, deterministic physics, which is a super hot topic uh, in the past month, um, MMO or voice and video. And I, I'm, I'm sure we don't cover a lot of other topics too. Um, okay, so let's start with part one, that code is hard. So, um, Networking is about two things mainly, um, which you would like to differentiate. So number one is transport um, and number two is simulation. So transport is purely transferring data between clients. Um, so delivering data from A to B. So here you have the world map. So um, and, and transport is basically limited by the speed of light. So the infrastructure is very fast. Nevertheless, if you would send a package from Europe to US, be it East Coast or West Coast, it's taking 100, 250 milliseconds. So there's no way to, um, to get rid of this la that latency. And no matter if you have 5G or 6G or 10G, at some point speed of light is as fast as you can get. So you will have to deal with that latency. Of course, you, you don't only have latency, but you have packet loss and jitter and internet weather, let's say, where sometimes it works well, sometimes not so well. And there are different protocols, UDP, TCP, or in the web browser, secure web circuits or WebRTC, which are the common protocols. So all this is pretty common. And there are transport solutions out there, which are just transporting data from A to B. So, so we have one which is Photon Cloud real-time. Steam has a, like 
uh, like a super popular one, obviously. So Steam Network gives you that transport layer. Epic Games has ramped up uh, transport layer, but but that's pretty much it. So there are not too many other transport layers out there. Um, you may ask, if there are other technologies. So there's um, multiplayer uh, from Unity, which is ramping up game service. But technically speaking, it's not not really a transport. It's more a hosting layer, same as Game Lift from Amazon or Amazon in general, Azure, and all these hosting providers are providing hardware and, and networking, but they don't provide, uh, let's say, a transport layer for gaming. So then the interesting part if you do multiplayer be it vr or mobile or pc is the simulation part so this is where the magic happens this is where you synchronize uh, data between clients and this is the point or the the um, situation where you have to deal with latency with loss and jitter to make to make it a great experience here you want to to have multiplayer to feel great and this is where your players or users will complain about laggy experiences, jitter, wrong predictions and whatnot. So this is where the, the interesting stuff happens. And this is where the, um, the networks or frameworks which are out there um, basically are organized. So, and we put, let's say a, a couple of um, famous ones in there so you can see there's a cluster of um, MLABI, which is um, the Unity Initiative, um, Normcore, Mirror, or PAN. And then there's another cluster on top here, which is Bold, Fusion, Quantum, which are products from us, or um, .NET Code, or Unreal Engine Networking. So and I, um, we, we divided them into two clusters because the lower cluster here is actually more towards transport. Um, and the upper um, solutions are more advanced. And one of the core advanced features with these products is um, what we call tick-based. And we will uh, demystify that um, in the next slide um, when I hand over to, to Eric. So, um, so how do you synchronize state, right? Um, so what is so difficult about it? Um, so, and I would hand over to, to Eric yes. to dive a bit into that. So, as Chris laid out, well, the, the three different levels here, just sending data around and um, touching on what kind of data you need to synchronize the state. Why isn't that enough, right? So, if it's just about sending state around and you have good solutions for um, transport. So, the answer is because time, accurate time matters. So... <clears throat> Um, anybody who develops for VR knows how important it is to keep the rendering rates of your VR experience at the exact uh, refresh rate of the device you're using. So 72 for Quest 1 or 90 for Quest 2 and, and so on. Because every time you skip a frame like that, you break the immersion, you, you create problems for the perception of uh, quality of the, of the experience, the player is having, etc. So that is not only about rendering. That's actually about how things move around uh, in space. And that's how you perceive the experience you have. And when you go for networking, the same thing is, is important. So you need to make sure that this data that you're transferring around is presented to the player or the user in a very accurate timing. Uh, otherwise, you completely break the immersion. And, and that's where solutions that actually are designed for this problem get into, because they start from the ground up by making the data transfers be based on time or ticks. And that is the fundamental basis for solving this problem. Just like rendering with steady ticks on a refresh rate that you, you have is important for the rendering. For the simulation, it's the same. And when you have networking, because you have multiple devices, that becomes hard to solve. So it's time that matters. Chris, so time, wanna, yeah. yeah, time is just one of the aspects, let's say, of, of um, state-of-the-art multiplayer, uh, multiplayer frameworks. So um, 
so let's dive a bit into the history of, of high-end um, multiplayer games. And actually, um, we compiled the six features or core features that, um, let's say, all the best possible multiplayer games out there um, are, are using. You see them on the right here. If you'd go back into history in the end of the 90s um, and, and early 2000, um, there were three, let's say, milestones for multiplayer development, which was Tribes, Quake 3, and Counter-Strike, which defined, let's say, high-quality multiplayer experiences. And those games already used the, um, the six features, which are listed here on the right. So the, the most important one, what Eric explained, is the, the tick-based simulation, so to be, to be super time accurate. And if you go into the modern uh, times of games, so um, from Rocket League to whatever, Valheim, which was a recent hit, so the, the circle with the number here is basically the number of players per game. And what you see is um, the, the number of players um, is getting higher, let's say, in recent games, but it's kind of stagnating at around 100. You have some games, Rust was even up to 200. It's very Call low of, frequency, yeah. Call of Duty War Zones, 160. So, um, so Fortnite is, I think, around 100 Chris? as well. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are two main trends, right? So you have, you have the trend of the player count going super high. And but because of the limits of what can be done, that normally follows with a decrease in the tick rate, which is the other very important thing. And you have the competitive uh, scene where you have Valorant or Overwatch or Counter Strike, where they favor going on super high, super fast tick rate, and do, and because of that, they cannot go super high on the player count. So it's, these are the two main trends that are coming from let's say the late 90s and early 2000s to now so the differences are in these two kind of like almost a split uh, tendencies or trends high player count or super fast accurate tick rate and the ingredients are these they are six this, yeah. features on the right which we dive into um so this is state of the art. The downside or, or the reality is that um, if you want to learn about these six features, you have to watch countless uh, GDC talks. Um, so they, they are not documented anywhere or, or even implemented in an open source implementation. So you have to have a lot of knowledge. And um, so of course we are trying to compile all those features into, into our latest product. So I would hand over to, to Eric to walk us through the, well, we had the tick-based simulation already, right? So um, Eric, can you guide us through the other features? Yes, so I basically started with the idea that because time is important, the state-of-the-art and established, well-established solution for this is, is making the simulations tick-based. And that becomes the, the basis for building on top all the other things. So, um, really long time ago one important thing about it is that you need to you need to have an immediate feedback for the local player and that where client side prediction gets into the uh, the picture because you you cannot just send data to the server wait for it to simulate and then wait to receive let's say the safe data back from the server but you need to somehow predict in advance what's happening. And that's what means client-side prediction. So a lot of people talk about client-side prediction, but you can only really think about client-side prediction if you start with either a tick or time-based simulation, because otherwise you, you have a lot of trouble to do the rest. And, um, and that, that solves the problem of giving very fast and immediate feedback for the objects I control. But then you get to the problem of, and what about the data that I don't have control of? Like, how do I see other people um, or other players controlled characters or objects on my screen? And then um, the established solution for that is basically to use what we call snapshot interpolation. You, you, you use data that is safe and confirmed from the server, but that data is in the past. And because the data that comes from the server, remember, we are on the internet, we have jitter, we have network loss, we have internet weather, all that. So 
The data that comes from the server actually comes with a lot of variations in detail. Snapshot interpolation is a technique to actually present that data very smoothly, but still very tight to the players. And again, you can only do that on top of a tick or time-based simulation from the ground up. And, um, and these two together present an interesting problem, which is you have this dual timing, which your player is on a, on a predicted timing in the future, whereas what you see from others is in the past. And if you see the three examples, they are all shooters. They just become to be a very popular game genre. And then you, you have the problem of, because what you see is in the past, it's, it's a bit complex to solve how you actually shoot, you do these weapons or maybe even physics-based uh, interactions because what you see about other players, although it's snappy, tight and smooth, it is in the past. So that's where lag compensation comes from. It, it lets you um, resolve um, let's say queries like raycasts or shape overlaps, that, that kind of thing you do for, for either shooter game or in other kinds of interactions as well. So you solve those on a server actually based on what the player was seeing. But to do that super accurately, again, you can only do if you have a very precise simulation between the client and the server. So it all goes back to having a precise control of the simulation. Um, full physics prediction is, let's say, a subset uh, or a special case of client-side prediction, which is which turns to be the holy grail that everybody wants to do now. There is one very um, famous game that brought this to attention to everyone, which is um, Rocket League, which is listed here. So it is, it is a, it's a game that does... YZWIG fully predicted physics. And um, this is a subset of client-side prediction. It's it's complex topic as well, built on top of tick-based simulation. It's, it's, an, it's a topic on itself because uh, traditional physics engines are not designed for this. And although you can do with the, the regular physics engines like uh, PhysX, Havoc, or bullet or so on they're not designed for this so but but that's the subject of a, of a even a, let's see a longer talk about that roger also knows a, a lot about this topic and etc and to finish explaining what these topics mean uh replication algorithms go back to data transfer to transport layers because transport layers solve how you send data um back and forth but now because you have a tick-based simulation you have an opportunity to actually be very smart in the way you transfer this data. And there are two state-of-the-art techniques that are well-established. You either do delta snapshots, which is you compress data um, to send to a specific client based on what you know he already has there. This technique has, is, is used on Counter-Strike, is used on, um, the, the, I think the original Unity dots that code was using this, then they moved to eventual consistency, if I'm not mistaken. And it's one that we implement in Fusion as well. And the other state of the art technique is eventual consistency, which means you send data that changed. You still have compression and a lot of things, but these are the two, let's say, uh, industry standard, well-proved, and that you can still do slight improvements, but these are the right ways to send these things that help you. And more importantly, it should not matter which kind of replication algorithm you use for sending your data around. All the other five topics are unaffected by that. So, so you, can, you should really do, um, be able to do all the others without uh, caring which actual replication algorithm you're using. Chris, all right. to you. Cool, yeah. thanks. Maybe we can um, tackle a few of, of the questions. Like um, one question like, you know, why is XR making things harder? Um, and we have, so like one thing is like, if you have, if any of you have seen like GDC talks about um, Halo and others, they can use animations, like you press a button and the animation starts playing and they, you know, shorten the animation on uh, on other players compared to yours that the grenade like hits at the same time, etc. And in VR, we have less of those tricks available because the player has way more control than just button press it, which also means 
we have um, way more data which we need to send over the network to actually synchronize players. And we have one of the questions like, how can we have uh, you know more players in VR, um, you know, collaborating or playing together? Because what would be needed now to have like fifty plus players? Um, with all their you know, controllers and head positions being synchronized over the network be possible because every nearly every meeting app like restricts you to maybe eight, 16, very few go uh, beyond that. Many allow you to have maybe PC players coming in and watching the meetings, but most restrict themselves to a lower player count. Is that mainly due to the network bandwidth or is there another reason why nearly all applications out there which focus on VR are relatively restrictive in the number of user counts compared to, you know, Zoom or other meeting apps. Yeah, it's it's pre predicting our next slide. So um, I prepared something here by by incident. So we it it took us a while to. So it's it's about performance of the um, engine, and it's of course um, compression as well. But what you see here, Pan, which is our oldest product which is super successful and used by, by a lot of um, big applications like VR chat, even or rec room, right? So they use special customized, optimized versions, but still. Um, so which is where we say usually it's up to 32 players. So then um, Bolt came along. Um, so Pan was from 2011. So this is kind of the refactored version 2014. So already seven years old. And it was built for, let's say, up to 50 players. And with Fusion, which we, just, uh, which we are just launching, which has more or less the same features, but which was built from the ground up for, for performance and using a data-oriented data architecture, like a managed heap. So we are not using the garbage collector anymore, right? Everything is pre-allocated, reuse, and kind of... This is how I started programming, uh, let's say when I was a kid, right? Writing assembler and, and C and, and using memory like very efficiently. So these skills are coming back and getting and creeping into the engines. And you, you can build like super efficient code with, um, with C Sharp and, and, um, and Unity. And this way we get up to 200 players uh, in Fusion. Um, and we did some benchmarks on the right. It's not to, let's say, degrade other um, opponents or competitors, right? So for us, it's more a competition, right? It's all about just having the best possible performance. So you see bandwidth is definitely a major thing. So um, because of the um, delta snapshots and eventual consistency um, compared to other frameworks, depending on the number of objects, of course, you see there's a significant um, advantage uh, in Fusion, what we are able to achieve. If you take the CPU on the server, which is in the end defining the cost of your service, because this is defining how many servers you have to run, it's significantly better. And of course, it's the allocations per frame. So this is a garbage collector, which has to do less work. And this, because we don't use any garbage collection, everything is pre-allocated and reused. So, and, but, but you, with 200, we are talking about a 60 Hertz competitive shooter, right? If you would do like a, whatever 30 Hertz game or, or a less demanding game, you could probably double this or triple this. But you, at, at some point you will reach a limit where you need, let's say, an MMO tech where you, if, if you want to get higher. So that was a long answer uh, to a short question. So basically, when we see PUN, uh, because many ask, uh, is Bolt now deprecated or is PUN deprecated? Like if I start a new networked game and I decide, I have to decide between PUN, Bolt and Fusion, what would you currently say is the way to go? Do I lose anything? when I go Fusion compared to Bolt or Pun. So our goal is to, to make Fusion better all along, right? It, it's supposed to be the better Bolt. It's supposed to be the better Pun. It's not there yet because Pun is um, just so long out and so um, well received. But um, technically and performance-wise, it's outperforming. It's like if you take old cars and new cars, right? So every, every new project, we would say, get get on the new stuff. 
um, existing projects, we will not discontinue it or, or, or um, it, it, it's in maintenance mode, let's say we will fix bugs, but we don't put a lot of effort and innovation in these products anymore yeah. because the, the new techniques are just superior in, in big time. And one, someone asked if Fusion is actually compatible with Unity. Yeah, Fusion is only for Unity. So Fusion, and we design Fusion to be the best possible networking solution for Unity mm -hmm. using game objects. So this was our yeah, design it is, goal. Yeah. It is, it is game objects from the API perspective, the, the APIs people love, et cetera. Although internally, it's data-oriented. So yeah. internally, our stuff, it's all memory aligned buffers and all that. And also what is maybe not mentioned, but many things are, there's also code generation, other things, maybe you write less code, but basically Fusion will generate stuff for you to make your life as a developer easier. Um, and those are the things which maybe other frameworks don't do because it's a little bit more opinionated, but solves the most common scenarios for a networked game. Uh, that's uh, technically a Roger. Um... As, as if I'm correct, if I'm not wrong, ML API also uses a weaving technique. So yeah. some uh, UNET used code generation in, in the past as well. So these are these are valid options, and the, the the kind of code generation you use may differ, but it is a valid option that I think many are using. It's not it's not exclusive to us that part. Mm -hmm. um, so why would you say if I have to choose between the new you know, ML happy now on Unity Networking and Fusion. Um, how can I make an informed decision of what do I not get with one or the other? It's um, so Mirror and ML API are trans, uh, they solve transport, actually, they plug in transports, but they solve object serialization and sending around, but they have no concept of time aligned ticks at all. So if you are to do if you are to do to need these commodity these features that were let's say present already 20 years ago, you have to implement all by yourself. So tick uh, based simulation, snapshot interpolation, client side prediction, lag compensation, these are non existent. They, so you would need basically when you take you need, the current unity solution, you need to build all of those strategies yes. on top of the transport layer. Not the transport layer because they do serialization of game of of, of object game object data and and to be fair, uh, I know the ML API team is trying to to get better and 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 try try to do something in the right direction. Although uh, they're not there yet, but they're trying. So um, got us to that part as well. Um, there are some uh, fund other fundamental problems in our perspective with those approaches that end up showing in these benchmarks related to allocation and performance due to the way they work. But I don't want to get too much into that, right? So it's still, but the main difference is that they're not network simulations. They are the mid class, kind of like pun, mirror, and ML API. They are like on this, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, well, no. Five-year-old and a and a baby. <laughs> so um, yeah, so they're in that intermediate level where they solve you how to transfer data about objects here and there, but without any concept of time, and that lets a lot of the problems for you to solve, and that's what we try to solve with the higher higher end products, both quantum and fusion. That's the difference. And of course, the next question is, is fusion production ready? Fusion is almost production ready. We don't share ex specific ETAs, but we've been, mm -hmm. it's, we, we've been happy enough that it to share with anyone. So it's already a lot alive and available for anyone to download and try. Mm -hmm. And we are about to move it to a release candidate state. I cannot say exact dates, right? So we never share specific ETAs, but it's getting to release candidate very soon. And uh, still within this year into one zero final stable version for production readiness. And of course, uh, the next question is, do you plan to, um, as Fusion uses 
a lot of um, you know your custom uh, kind of mem no memory allocation etc. Do you plan to have it that you can potentially take it out of Unity and use it for Unreal or uh, Godot or you know other engines in the near future? Chris, do you want to take that one or? I... Yeah. So what what I learned in the past. I don't know, 18 years uh, is, is focus, is, is core. And we were one of the first uh, companies to, to embrace unity. And this is a focus of us. It's, it's tempting, right? So you have a lot of uh, amazing teams using Unreal. So we get a lot of questions if, if we want to support this. So it's it's always tempting and, we're, and, and I, I wouldn't exclude it, but short term, we, we just want to make Unity the best possible choice there. Cool. Should I yeah. go um, on? Yeah, I think for the poll, um, it seems like many have not implemented like client-side prediction, uh, snapshots and lag compensation. So for many, it's a uh, rather new topic and some have heard of it and they're interested to learn more or you know maybe learn some more resources about the complexity how hard it is etc so it seems only um 16 so very few of the audience have actually implemented their own <laughs> client type client side prediction lag compensation etc now maybe a good question is how important is it to do client side prediction all of that if you have not a competitive multiplayer game like rocket league or um, you know, Fortnite makes sense because everything has to be perfectly, um, you know, esports ready. But what if I have, um, I want to stack some cubes with someone, play Jenga in VR with someone. Do I need the client side prediction and the rollback and all of that, or can I use a more simpler approach? Not necessarily. You need those, right? It just it just happens that in. Um, if you see the most popular titles and games, they tend towards high object player count, survival game or a battle royale. Mm -hmm. or, and they do not go high tick rate just because they can't, otherwise they would. And the other end is high uh, frequency. But of course you have different kinds of experiences that do not need all that, of course. But if you are into any of those, you need to have a very, very efficient solution. But of course, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're writing something like um, very, very slow paced card game where you still need safety of the data that you're, that you're doing, we would not recommend Fusion or, or Quantum at all. We would not recommend anything like running a Unity instance as a server because that would not be cost effective. We we're going to get to that point uh, in the presentation here as well, talking about costs. So there are specific cases that, are, that do not fit into this, let's say, high end uh, networking. That different kind of solution is recommended. But, um, but when you, one of the things about VR and XR in general is that everybody's trying to get to high fidelity networked physics and that can only be which you work with right so which you know it can only be done at high end high frequency networking and with uh, these concepts that we discussed here but yeah it depends and we can see that a lot of um like if you if you talk on real unity or you guys everyone works on making interactions virtual physics based more accessible to more user because it is extremely hard. And if you uh, listen to uh, the Rocket League developers, like it, they say like it's not rocket science, but it's very close to make a physics-based kind of experience really work well, even if you have not the perfect conditions in terms of networking for each player. So um, it's definitely something which I think, especially in the spatial computing domain, we appreciate a lot to have more natural feeling interactions possible. And I stay a little bit with Fusion. Just someone asked if Pan 2 is basically fusion or if they're two different things and if there are any example projects where they could like you know get a glimpse of what fusion will provide or what they can do with fusion yeah so pun is like our tech from from the past right so it's it's we kept it fresh and up to date and it's super popular but fusion is like uh, like a hundred percent different um even though we try to, to make it very convenient and accessible. 
we upload the first samples in the asset store. So if you look for Fusion there, you find the first demo. So this is slowly starting on our website. You, you, you get the SDK and samples. We are building like very cool samples. So um, that's um, actually just to mention this on the next slide. So to showcase, we, we are building a Battle Royale 200 player game, which is yet unseen, um, especially in Unity. Um, so all the other AAA games have less. It has 60 hertz. So whereas all the other games have, have less, it's using lag compensation, interest management. It has a custom character controller, um, custom animation setup very lean and compact code. It runs on a single core. So it's the best possible TPS code you can get. Um, and um, so this is the type of stuff we want to give into the hands of, um, of developers to, to iterate on, right? So that you can build a game, which was before just for, for the riots uh, and, and AAA companies, actually now smaller teams can handle thanks to, um, to Unity and uh, thanks to our tech. So that's a goal. And of course, we want to do the same for VR applications. So we work with um, VR um, FPS or TPS games or conference applications. So we want to enable developers providing great, what we call templates. Um, you talked a lot about AAA games or like, you know, high quality networking. Um, you have questions. Is it like how expensive is Fusion? Can I own, can I actually afford it if I'm an indie developer, or do I need to be, you know, a large size AAA studio to be able to afford Fusion and build my game on top of it? I can maybe jump a bit to to the front, right? So because it's always um, it's always a question. Um, I heard Photon is expensive, right? Somebody said, or, or uh, people cannot really judge. So we uh, we did by accident, we did a, a smash it, right? We just wanted to do a stunt and, and launch a game for fun. And we didn't thought it would be successful and it became 150,000 downloads a day, a game called Stumble Guys using Quantum in this case. And so I can share the numbers because it's our game or we partner with um, Kitka Games, a Finnish studio. Um, so it's, it's monetizing horribly, right? If, if, if another mini clip or these guys would have this game, this would have to do much more. Nevertheless, it's making $400,000 per month. Um, so, and, and even if it's monetizing badly, so the CCU cost, let's say, what an external team would have or would pay us would be around fifteen thousand dollars, right? If you if you isolate the fifteen thousand dollars, you would say, well, this is expensive, right? Well, yeah, of course, fifteen thousand is a lot of money, but actually, you're making four hundred thousand dollars a month on a game that does not make good revenue because the yeah. revenue so, KPI is not good. Yeah. So this is around three point eight percent. If if you take these numbers. So, and depending, so, so you would probably calculate, and we have very good running games of like Golf Clash, for example, right? They are the masters of monetization. So it's, it's like zero point something percent there um, for a less good monetizing game. But of course, I mean, if you launch a free game and have no revenue, I mean, uh, everything is expensive, right? So, um, so is it expensive? No, but of course you need the, the goal to actually make revenue. And we have for questions of, uh, you know, the abbreviations like um, DAU, um, CCU, what are those metrics um, you talked about? Yeah, so the, the core metrics are just three, let's say. Of course you have much more, right? Up, down and whatnot, but that's not so um, interesting for us. So CCU is our currency, which is concurrent users. So. Mm -hmm players connected at the same moment in time. Daily active users, you already have to know the users. And, and we, uh, in our case, we don't track users. So we have no idea if, if a user returned, right? If you would log in five times, you would be just one daily active user. But we have a rule of thumb, which is uh, 20 times the CCU is a daily active users count and 20 times the daily actives is a monthly active users count. 
So for example, if you have a thousand concurrent users, which doesn't sound a lot to many people, they think, oh, this is, I, I get easily a thousand CCU. This is in fact 20,000 daily active and 400,000 monthly active, right? So you need half a million downloads in, in a month to get a thousand CCU. Yeah. Um, and especially for unexperienced people, this is unbelievable, let's say. Um, but it's it's a reality. So we check that number. And with Stumble Guys, uh, you actually can see that, that this applies. So um, here I, I copied actually from the dashboard, you see it's like 30,000 CCU, but it's dividing across. So you see all the different regions from, from Japan, South America, India, and whatnot. All this adds up. So 30,000 CCU in this case, um, and the DAU, which I get from game analytics is 800,000. So, yeah, so this have... is even more generous. It's about like yeah. 24 times. Yeah. So 20 is, is even conservative. So you need more than 20 times the CCU you expect as daily active to actually reach that number. So people think 100 CCU is easy to get. It's not. 100 CCU, you require a lot of yeah. so 2,000 people playing daily, which translates to 40,000 downloads are 50. So you have to sell 50,000 copies of your game to get to 100 CCU constantly, which is, let's say, a pay one time plan in all of these uh, things like Fusion or Pond, for example. So it's, 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 a yeah. it's, it's free for development, even if you have smaller uh, setups. It's very, very doable. <laughs> so we run, um, so Phasmophobia is a good sample, right? So this was used, or is using Photon. It became a smash hit. So, uh, so it's extreme, I think millions and millions of, of revenues. Um, and it went berserk during COVID initially. It went down, but still, oh, this, this is still very, very high. Um, it's not as high as it, it used to be. But um, so, and this is basically a single guy in, in the UK. Now it's, a, I mean, he, he hired a bunch of people, right? The success um, made him scale his company. Same with Rec Room or VR Chat, both were um, having a lot of uh, success. So good that we um, jumped into this uh, part. So um, let's go back. So that was a showcase. Yeah, we wanted to dive a bit into network topologies. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure it's, um, we, we spent like 45 minutes. Um, I would like- yeah. not... maybe, maybe we can quickly just summarize like we had a few examples of very successful um, multiplayer games, right? What kind of network architecture are used by, you know, Fortnite, um, Valheim, those kind of yeah. most popular ones, which we know are successful, um, do they use peer-to-peer -peer, um, or, you know, server-client? Yeah. So I, I would jump here, uh, jump, jump in here and do this really quick. So Eric, uh, chime in um, to elaborate a bit more if necessary. So there are fundamentally four networking topologies. So this covers pretty much let's say the common strategies of multiplayer. So independent of, of our technologies. So there's a dedicated server. Um, so there are clients, three client server strategies and one deterministic one. So client server, they're the most popular and used by all the AAA games is basically dedicated server where you run a headless server running the, the game engine, usually headless which can be Unity or Unreal um, and scaling this. For every game, you ramp up a server and you need an orchestration provider for this, which is multiplayer game, this game I. So there are a bunch of them out there. So this is by far the, for the triple A games, this is the most popular solution. So Fortnite and then all these guys are using this Rocket League. Um, it is very good because it's, this is, um, what Fusion supports as well. The, the server is running the physics. It's like cheat proof. It's like the best possible physics experience and everything. So then um, you have a cheap, a cheap brother of this version, which is 
instead of you know running dedicated service is quite expensive so you could probably say um, while in photon it's 20 cent to 50 cent per ccu um, running this is probably 10 times the cost uh, most likely so it's between a dollar to three dollars or even more per ccu um, it doesn't matter because these games really monetize well so um, but still it's a decision that some a lot of indie games are saying okay all the players have powerful pc pc so i run the server actually on one of the client pcs but technically it's the same thing you just save running a dedicated server which is under your control and trading it with, with a client um, and this is obviously super cost effective there's, there's one big disadvantage, which is the, the, the client could just die and disappear or a network in his house is breaking down and the game is dead. Um, so you need host migration and a lot of challenges here. Um, so that's the, the second option, which is used by more low budget or, or smaller indie games, but still it's super popular. So Steam is full with that. And it's for VR and, and industry applications. This is a very valid choice. And then you have like the shared room approach, which is a lot of uh, photon games and then pun games are using this approach. It's very, very cost efficient. It works Chris, well. Yeah. I'd like to mention here. Yeah, you, you mentioned here on the example. So Among Us, a huge success. It is a shared room based game with clients authority just like this so it's the biggest example of uh yeah. together with phasmophobia on phasmophobia. our side so these are yeah super smash hits rec room vr them. chat yeah so which is mainly um it's not like super physics network right um so and and it's cost efficient very stable scale as well um so, and then the, the new kit on the block is a deterministic approach, which I think would be even a separate session, but this is for fighting games, RTSs, uh, would, would use this approach. It's very cost efficient as well. Um, do, you, do you know which, like, Brawls, like Supercell is one of the most successful mobile phone, you know, multiplayer companies out there, like for Clash Royale and Brawl stores, do they go with the deterministic approach or did they do client server? We don't know that. Yeah, they I have, wish I know. <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew. Yeah. Um, it, it definitely works really well with determinism because we have, oh, so for example, the recently launched on Apple Arcade Lego Star Wars Battles, which is similar to uh, Clash, Clash Royale, Royale, is made mm -hmm. with Quantum. So, okay. and it works flawlessly. The guys are super happy with it. Uh, the developers, so uh, we don't know about Supercell. Yeah. Because I noticed that in those games, the network traffic, like our battery consumption, all of it is extremely low. Mm -hmm. Like you can get, when you go to somewhere, some other place and you have to pay for each data transfer, right? With your mobile phone. Um, those Supercell games have always an extremely low footprint on how much megabyte they use while you play the game. Um, so that's why I have a hunch that it's probably more only synchronizing inputs instead of a lot of state or other things. But, you know, yeah. we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, they, they could also have uh, something that's a semi state transferring that they that are, so the server defines uh, movement from A to B for in a time period for that and send just that data once for each one of the units. That can also be very effective in terms of bandwidth. And uh, maybe it's that we don't know. It, we didn't, let's say, analyze or reverse engineer anything like that. No, we don't know. So yeah, so these are the four architectures which exist. Mm -hmm. Down here, you see the, the different game types uh, which mm -hmm. fall into the different buckets. It's not a clear choice, so we have a... Um... Yeah, I'd like to mention one more, Chris. So yeah. that's on the determinism side. So it's a super popular title called Brawlhalla. So Brawlhalla is mm -hmm. a predictable back deterministic custom thing by themselves, but it is. And so this is a, the essential question uh, or what we try to help um, developers, especially you tell us what are you trying to build and mm -hmm. what is the best architecture or product to pick. So in this case, it's of course photon specific, but it applies to, to any other tech as well. 
So um, if you see this is the dedicated server, client hosted, shared, or um, deterministic. And then you see, um, for example, a MOBA is popping up in, in, um, in, in shared or in server, or it can be even done in deterministic. So everything has its pros and cons. But if you have a competitive FPS, we would definitely say, okay, go for dedicated server. This is best practice. If you have an RTS or fighting game, it's definitely deterministic. This is best practice, predict rollback. A shared mode if you do like a training application meeting conference application go with shared mode because you don't need let's say the the um, network physics part of it usually it's like very cost efficient but it's I mean, different do you yeah. do a small training application or do you do like a like a global yeah huge I mean, training application ju just to be clear you can still network physics objects in shared mode it's just that it would not be let's say to the threshold I consider it to be networked physics and you as well, Roger, which is super accurate YZWIG physics. But you can still, of course, have networked rigid bodies. It's not, but it's not going to be as accurate as you have on full prediction mode in fusion or in quantum with full. Yeah, because rec rec room definitely has some physics, like you have a basketball, yeah. you can throw a ball, etc. Yeah. And you also asked some, someone asked about the VR chat that said that they support more than 200 players, like they'll go 600 or more players active in Rec Room. And the question is, do they use uh, one of your solutions or do they do that custom? How can they manage to go above the 200 players? So, I'd like it's, to. It's an illusion, most likely. So, yeah. Um... <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not talking something about here, which I'm under yeah. NDA, but no, it's not. <laughs> but I, I'd like to mention one topic here. So uh, prior to Fusion, in sh which also has shared mode, we didn't have, let's say, a built-in solution for doing interest management, which is sending data about only objects that you are close to, et cetera, directly from the built-in solution. I mean, we had that in both, but not in, in PUN, for example. And these uh, games like uh, these applications like VRChat, they, they implement on top of our uh, solutions on the server side possible code like Fulton Server plugins to help them handle all that and get to incredibly, incredibly high numbers. And this is exactly what we're, we're doing with Fusion now because Fusion now has, has built-in interest management that runs on actually on the Fulton Server. So even on shared mode, you can actually go a lot, a lot higher then you could, let's say, with the turnkey solution before with Pond, for example. We don't even know what the limit is because it has not been stressed enough yet. It, it depends on the tick rate you choose and in the special case and how much data you have, how, how much spread you have on the players and objects on this space on a conference, for example. So there is not a hard limit, actually, for fusion in shared mode, for example. Yeah, we have a question like if shared mode is the same as just a relay server, or is there something more to it? It has it has a logic running on the server. The the, the, the it actually has knowledge about the state and controls everything in there. So, so it's more than just yeah. Yeah, pan uh, to differentiate here. So pan was mainly a relay. So there was very slim logic on the server. There was a we called it cached events. So you had some history or so, but it was not the complete game state. So in Fusion, it's it's a complete game state. So if you late join a game, you get the complete state. The server doesn't have the physics and the full simulation, so it cannot control authoritative, let's say. But um, so you basically, if you take an object and move it and the client is telling the server, this is where I move it, then that's it, right? So it's, it's client authoritative. Nevertheless, the server has the complete game state in the Fusion case. Other technologies use a different approach, right? So, so the problem evidently with that is cheating. Is there anything you can do if you want to use the shared room approach due to cost efficiency, et cetera, to mitigate cheating? We have... We have cool, successful games using pun, very, very large games. And if, if you are successful, you, you will attract cheaters. And then there are strategies to, to mitigate those. So one is, for example, to have statistics, right? So you, you are suspicious if you are better than the 
average. So, and then you can deal with these people in a special way, right? If you do, do too many headshots in a go, there's something wrong, obviously. Um, but the ultimate way to protect against cheating is, of course, server authority running a simulation on the server. And um, that's the only proper way, but there are tons of very pragmatic ways which work, but the best solution is always authority. Someone asked, like, are there any good like objective comparisons between um, you know, the Unity ML, ML API, which is now Unity's uh, networking layer, the norm core uh, and others, um, you know, because you provided comparisons evidently, but it, it's very hard to assume that there's not some kind of bias of, you know, specifically selecting maybe things which will make Fusion look better than other solutions. Are there any reviews or good articles out there which, you know, objectively compare those frameworks with each other, um, which is not coming from, you know, you guys, which can be biased? So first of all, we are biased <laughs> for sure. So I don't, uh, that's for sure. Um, nevertheless, everything we tell is you can, you can check for yourself, right? So this is like the, the comparison. And the six features we just listed, like tick-based simulation and yada, yada, yada. So those features and performance. So it's right there, right? So. Um, there's no, I, we are not aware yet of any independent um, study. This will follow, I think. Um, Fusion is, is um, getting great feedback, so I'm, I'm not worried. And we are here to compete, right? We, we just want to build the best tech. It's not to lie to developers, so that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but still, yeah, everybody has to make his own choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the group, you can, as we did, try out the different frameworks and see what they provide on your own without yes, committing course. to something before. It will take you time because many have different APIs. You have to learn a lot of things, how would those frameworks do things. And then the best is just to try it out for yourself. Um, we did that as well. We continue to do that because there's still too many good solutions out there to be sure what is the right tech to do. And sometimes we know other studios, which uh, especially when you do want to do physics-based interactions, they spend sometimes months evaluating and implementing the same game in three different network solutions and test it in bad conditions to really figure out, okay, what is the solution to go for before we release it? Because when you release a networked game and things don't work out well, um, it's really difficult to get the reviews back up and keep people engaged. When you once you release it, you have to be sure that the choice you made on the network stack really holds up, even if you have maybe more success than you anticipated. Like uh, it can happen so often. Um, we know a lot of VR games which came out of nowhere and got immensely popular, and no one knows really why that exploded so fast. So that's a really good strategy to like try all the frameworks out. Most of them are accessible for free, and then test test on the back conditions, not just in a LAN setup with your friend, that's not um, the thing to do because there you will not get the problems which uh, for misprediction, all of that and test it in real network scenarios, try to find tools to, some frameworks have tools directly implemented that you can say, okay, that much package loss, that much lag, um, et cetera. And you, you can get the experience. Other tools exist where you can fake it, so to speak, to the server or to um, your client hosting environment. And I would heavily recommend to do that. Uh, before you settle on one technology and then, you know, build the whole infrastructure around it to actually support it. And uh, the question, one question is, and I fully understand that that is confusing, what is between the client server approach and determinism? Like, what does that mean? Like, what, why is it not the same? Shouldn't every simulation be deterministic in theory? Um, because computers have zeros and ones, right? They should always give you the same results, no matter what you do. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. I, I, I can take that one also because I answered um, one related question here on the chat. So, so with determinism, what you have is given the same data as input, both the initial state of the simulation and player inputs, you guarantee that you get to the same, very same result. First, 
Um, most uh, game libraries are not deterministic. As long as soon as you start using float numbers, you lose that because different computers, different hardware use different rounding modes when performing multiplications, for example, and that drifts the computation. So they're not going to be the same, although they all follow IEEE uh, 7554. Um, so determinism basically is hard because you have to build all the libraries you use I would say yourself, in our case, we built all those for, for the customers. So we have physics engine, navigation, AI, SDK, math library, everything we built to be cross-platform deterministic. So to avoid the pitfalls of non-deterministic libraries. So if you think about Unity, nothing in Unity is deterministic. But then do you really need determinism? It depends. So determinism is a very uh, interesting approach that you don't think about networking anymore. You just transfer input. But it requires you to get to this different mindset where you have to rewrite your game with a different, basically with a different engine, not with Unity. Unity becomes um, more like a shell, like a view for the rendering, where the game is actually running on a different engine that is designed to be deterministic. And um, the other question I had was, isn't it good to have a deterministic physics engine also on state transfer? A lot of people ask this question and, and think about it, but I was writing on the other answer that that's not really important because when you're talking about state transfer, you, even if you're transferring at 10 Hertz, what creates the drifts that are mostly perceived? Of course, in the long term, the non-deterministic one would drift, but what creates the actual drifts that you have to correct are not the, it's not the fact that the engine is not deterministic, but actually the different player inputs that you predicted wrong. And then the, the, the physics engine goes different and you have to fix those very frequently. So as soon as you go state transfer, you have to constantly correct, regardless of your physics engine being deterministic or not, because you're not able to predict correctly the other player's inputs. That's the main source of non-determinism because we're not using the inputs themselves. And, and uh, then the other thing is that determinism is not the most limiting factor on these other engines. The most limiting factor is the fact that they're not easily, they cannot be easily rolled back and re-simulated. Because regardless of being deterministic or not, that's the most important thing. You have to be able to reset and re-simulate. And these engines are not built for this. These physics engines are not built for this. Although you can do that in physics, we do, but it, it does have, let's say, a limit for how much you can do that. And that's where you know Unity is building their deterministic physics engine as well as Unreal is building their chaos physics engine should be deterministic. Although Unity initially claimed that Burst will be cross-platform deterministic in terms of floating point numbers, um, I think it's still not the case, and we haven't had any update if it will be actually cross-platform deterministic. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have updates on that. Yeah. And, and so originally, hopefully... originally, their engine was also stateless, but it's not anymore. It's, it's also now a bit more difficult to reset it because they added a bit more cache data, if I remember. I yeah, don't know they, what's they, the state of They it. had the problem with, with stacking cubes, um, mm -hmm. as yeah. it always is, because you need some state to actually make them not jiggle onto infinity. Um, unfortunately, we are coming up to the end. Um, we have answered most of the questions. We unfortunately couldn't answered go through all the of, questions. Yeah. Um, uh, I hope we get most of them. If you have additional questions, of course, don't hesitate to join our Discord from XR Bootcamp and ask there. We will probably, um, if we haven't already created the multiplayer you know, channel there where you can ask questions. Um, I hope everyone got their questions or their interest peaked in the solutions out there. Of course, we didn't go into in detail about um, what is uh, Unity's new solution? What is it really good at or bad? I think most or um, there's good solutions or demos out there for nearly all of, of the different uh, types of networking solutions. Um, definitely dots uh, Unity's dot solution is definitely interesting, it takes a lot of time to get used to, and it's currently not production ready and hard to find documentation, which is accurate. They currently cannot assimilate physics. So if you want to have a physics capable solution out there, which a lot of VR devs are looking for, um, currently, I would say, look at the, try out Fusion, 
quantum is also something which is um, takes away nearly all the complexity of multiplayer, makes it a little bit boring. But uh, basically, you write the code like a local multiplayer thing. Check out that one. Um, Dark Rift, if you want to be build basically your own solution, is also a very uh, interesting package. It's available free on the asset store. There are a lot of really cool tools out there. And if you want to learn about network and make your own experience, definitely start from maybe the transport layer. Unity has a new transport layer and build basically your own solution on top of that. Um, if you want to have something which you need to release maybe within a year or two, I would go for a higher level solution. Uh, Fusion is the new kid on the block, so to speak, which has a lot of learnings from uh, Pun and Bolt and has, has not been yet industry tested. I mean, it's not out there for years. If you want to go for something which is tried and true and we know has worked well for many successful applications, then probably Bolt and Pun are not a bad choice for that. Although if you are starting now, I personally would go for Fusion um, and look a little deeply into it and you know, just experiment and try out what you can do. Maybe have a few direct questions. If someone comes up to the panel and wants to ask a direct question, Ferran, can you maybe pull some, someone up which has a direct question? Just raise your hand. You're muted. Yeah, I will lower all hands now. Uh, if someone wants to uh, ask directly to us, I know that, uh, for example, uh, Luca had one question. Uh, he has an interesting idea. I also invited him. So uh, is there any uh, slide that we need to show or should we stop sharing screen? Up to you guys. So just- Depends on the questions, right? Maybe we yeah. have a slide which can help yeah. uh, explain yeah. certain things. Yeah. Um, there's also like what we can maybe share afterwards in the mail we send out is like a, a there's a Git repository which uh, goes a little bit into all the networking sources which are currently out there to read upon. Gaffron Games, for example, has a very cool um, write up of how to do VR network stacking of cubes and how complex it is. Maybe we'll share a little bit more information when we um, on either our Discord or maybe through mail if um, anyone is interested in that. Um, okay, um, there is actually um, one question from uh, Luca, but I don't know if he's here now. So um, maybe we can we can directly uh, quickly share his question. So because it's a little bit like related with VR, I also want to take this question. So he's asking, given this scenario in VR, two or three people are inside the same physical room, share the same space and have VR headsets, for example, Quest. The network is therefore local. It does not use the internet. Uh, the type of interaction is that of a typical escape room. They must know where they are. If they touch their hands in VR and they also touch their hands in reality, probably wall or table, uh, is meaning. They must be able to throw pass virtual objects there are objects that implement physics with joints of various types. Which multiplayer framework is best suited to simulate this scenario? Joints. That's, yeah, that's relatively easy. So we have a couple of customers in that uh, domain. So it's um, so it used to be Bolt, where um, it's now Fusion. So we run like a dedicated server, either in the local LAN or one of the clients even is the host. Um, and you get everything he's, he's asking for. So network physics, you can map it even to, to location. So we have a couple of uh, companies um, doing exactly this. So one is Holo Cafe, for example, which is doing local um, VR games, in this case using Vive, but it, it doesn't really matter. Perfect. Um... Yeah, we can take a few more questions. I think we have seven minutes left. Uh, maybe Roger or you can select a few of the um, questions. Yeah, like one question was like, if Fusion is aimed at game object or if it uses dots in any way. I want to take that one. Um, so, uh, Fusion is for game objects, but I'd like to restate this. Uh, Unity says the same, right? So you guys had to talk about dots. Dots is more than ECS, mm -hmm. right? So ECS is a way to expose gameplay logic that we are fan of, for example, for quantum. It's a, way, a good way to solve when you have 
specific kinds of problems. But DOTS is more than that. It's about data oriented. So Fusion is data oriented in the first place. So the way we handle data internally is exactly like these ECSs do with memory aligned blocks of memory that we are very carefully laying out and working on top of. Secondly, we also like the Unity production ready parts of DOTS. So, so, so far that we use them. So um, Fusion optionally lets you compile its Delta compressor using Burst because it's a great way to get some speed up on that. And just to mention Quantum uh, triggers on the clients, it's parallel task system that runs the simulation using jobs, Unity jobs actually to handle the thread start and everything. So these are production ready solutions for. And so DOTS, is, DOTS as an approach is great is how everybody should design mm -hmm. things when you're talking about performance sensitive or performance critical parts of things, but it doesn't have to be what you expose to our developers in my opinion. So the game object approach is very interesting to democratize how people uh, create games and Unity also recognizes this with the effort now on the net code for game objects. Of course, if you look for an ECS from the DOTS for an ECS solution for networking, there's currently the one from Unity, which is still in heavy development, uh, netcode. Although be careful because you cannot really use physics yet. They have, are working on it. Yeah. Whenever it comes out, uh, we have not heard since around six months, we haven't heard exactly where the state is, but they plan at least the last one I've heard from them is they plan to fully support physics uh, with Unity physics in the networking code, but currently you cannot run it without a lot of um, hacks, so to speak. The other solution out there is Dotsnet, which is from the same team which did Mirror. Um, mm -hmm. It's currently not doing client time prediction or other things. Currently, it does, um, you know, synchronizing like it's more of a transport in the diagram we have before uh, than a simulation yet but he's working on it hard. The, the problem is as many um, asset store de um, developers have with the ECS part is that Unity stopped communicating. So um, it's hard for them to you know, invest a lot of time into development yeah. of that framework when they don't know what Unity is planning, how much will be changing on the API layer, et cetera. So uh, I would definitely take both into consideration, especially the one from Unity, you can experiment freely. Um, they have predictions, they even have like what you can do is with, in the physics engine, you can do predictive rate casts. Uh, that stuff works just if you want to do a really physics based simulation, you can only do server does all the computation client, you just synchronize states, which only works under land conditions, basically. Yeah. Uh, be because you mentioned the Unity physics on, on their dots, uh, dots net code thing, which is an interesting thing because that initiative is using is sticking the right things right so they're they're starting from from the ground up with good principles we don't know where it's going to get if it's going to be released at all but i'd like to mention that because physics is such an important topic and uh because of the limitations of, of the non um the physics engine is not designed for this that i talked about i'd like to mention one more thing which is Everybody's on the race for this, right? So uh, <laughs> Unreal, Unity, everybody's trying to do, even if it's not deterministic, but a lighter weight engine that can work with predict rollback. Matter of fact is that we already have this engine because we built it for quantum. So we already have a stateless, fully production ready and tested physics engine. And we've said this publicly on our Discord. We're working on it to port it to floats and burst to actually use a non-deterministic version of it, but fully stateless with Fusion as an option to PhysX. Of course, we're agnostic to what you can use, whatever you want, including PhysX or another bespoke physics engine, but we're gonna try to provide a much more complete design for, I mean, complete in this feature set, which is pretty rollback. So I wanted, because you were talking about these different physics engines, I wanted to mention that we're not just waiting for things to happen. We already have such an engine and you know it, you've used it. So mm. we're working on that for floats as well. Um, okay. One one thing maybe I can tell, uh, we are recording all these questions as well. Yeah. So uh, we have a special Discord uh, channel mm. in our server that we will actually um, continue the discussion there uh, throughout the next days and weeks. So our experts will also check there as well and answer there. So please feel free to 
join the discussion there. There's one question I would like to ask actually from much more a little bit non-game side of things from Andre uh, Lunev. Uh, he asked, uh, what is the actual latency in transport in EU, uh, probably Europe, he means. Uh, do you have any comment on this? Do you have any latency data that you actually we, we are not we are not tracking uh, let's say latency um, mm. from from the clients but Europe is extremely well built so our servers for example are in Amsterdam so we decided not to run multiple regions and it's like 50 to 100 milliseconds on, on mobiles on PC it's even better when I build a networked application which range of lag should I test you know to assume that the majority of users will get that experience which i already tested how far do i need to go um to you know cover the majority of users which will play my experience um is that a question from you yeah i mean like oh, how much what would okay. you recommend like do so, i have sorry. to go to 500 milliseconds do i have to go is 100 enough like where do i need so, to test so, so there's one thing, let's say you you th theoretically approach it, right? And uh, let's say very like, oh, I need to find out, right? And with Stumble Guys, as you see, we just launched it, right? I mean, the, the game has a rating of 4.3. People are freaking out about it. And it's they play it in India, in, in, I, I mean, in, in Southeast Asia or in South America like crazy. Number, we were number one in Japan. <laughs> and... It's 32 player on mobile phone. I mean, you cannot really get a harder device, let's say, or conditions. I, I can just say it works, right? And it, uh, I mean, we don't connect people from Southeast Asia to South America. So I think this is not a good idea. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't really matter, to be honest. Um, depending, I, of course, depending on what you do. But otherwise, I wouldn't think too much about it and just let the success speak for itself, right? I, I think the network is good enough, the devices are good enough, so there's no excuse for, for um, not launching a successful game or application. And, and of course, we couldn't cover like all um, the topics. Like, there's a lot of things about uh, how do you do matchmaking, you know, in a server, how do you make sure that uh, someone from the US doesn't play with someone from maybe Europe and have, has a bad experience. Uh, all of those topics we couldn't cover um, in one talk today. And there's also like, how do you build an orchestrated server? We had a few questions about how do you build then those Unity instances that they spin up, spin down to minimize costs. And so those are all interesting topics, I think, which have not a clear solution yet out there which uh, often studios build their custom solutions or you know, contact multiplayer from Unity um, to maybe provide those solutions. Um, and that's, those are all interesting topics, but we didn't have time to cover them today. But if you're interested or if this talk didn't cover your need in terms of networking and multiplayer, please let us know what, um, what we were missing, what you thought was not sufficiently covered or was not sufficiently highlighted. Um, and we know there are like Dark Rift, uh, Forge Networking. There's there's many, many solutions out there which are interesting. And for example, I personally started with Dark Rift because I wanted to have a very low level framework where I build my own experiments on top of them. It's a fantastic tool to just get started with networking and see what everything you don't know about networking until something feels good and how hard it is to implement a tick-based system where you where actually things are properly synchronized. Um, we recommend you to just try things out if you uh, want to build on, you know, industry tried and true examples, I think Pond and Bolt are, are certainly not bad, but Fusion is currently the thing I would most developers recommend to at least give it a shot. There are VR examples um, directly, which you can uh, stack cubes on top of each other. I tried it as well. And it, I was surprised how well it actually worked um, uh, as well as uh, Quantum is dear and close to my heart because I love the ECS architecture. Um, maybe give that a look. If you love the data-oriented approach and ECS kind of way of programming, definitely give Quantum a shot. Um, otherwise, uh, Unity's net uh, networking is also exciting, but it's very rough in its stages. So 
give it a shot, give it a try. Uh, there are really good guides out there already, which explain a little bit how to actually use it, but it's still rough around the edges and has not, I don't think you can now build a fully fledged experience with it without a lot of effort on your part. Whereas Fusion, there are a lot of things already there and maybe it has not the longevity of experience of pun with hundreds of games being out there, but the, the core of it, right, has been done by a team, which I think knows very well how successful network and multiplayer games work out there. Um, and it's very exciting to see how, um, how little networking you have to understand to build an experience. I think that's, that's the main thing you get with those frameworks is that you might not need to understand everything, how you efficiently pack bytes into, an, uh, into the streams that you minimize your cost and other things. Many things have been solved for you. And it might be a little bit boring for some of you more technically focused people that all those complicated and interesting problems have been solved. And for that, you have lower level um, net frameworks which allow you to more experiment and maybe come up with your own fascinating new solution. But for those of you which need to ship a title and wanna be sure that it will not break down on the heavy load of millions of, uh, of users suddenly playing it because they fell in love with it. Um, I think using a more higher level approach might be not a bad choice, at least to give it a try and experiment. I, I, I'd like just to comment to a few more on that. It's, it's still welcome for highly advanced programmers to use Fusion because there are things behind the curtain that you do not use like that, but they are right there for you. So we have very clever guys doing some crazy things by accessing the lower level ways of doing things as well. And same can be said for quantum, right? So we have people building super complex task systems in their own things with our parallel task system that we not, not normally explain on the, let's say, initial documentation, right? So not, I mean, a network developer might not like that because we're talking about like creating extremely complex gameplay implementations or is, and sometimes ways of transferring data yes especially in fusion but it's valid what you said but i wanted to add this other layer perfect so um keep in mind that we will continue multiplayer uh, framework and development related uh, events lectures open lectures classes so this is just the beginning we saw that there is an uh, definitely an interest so we will continue and please feel free to suggest uh, different topics that need to be covered uh, in that uh, next one. Uh, so we are happy to also add that to the next one's agenda. Uh, thank you guys for today, for spending your time with us. Uh, I think uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, key takeaways from today. And uh, let's execute a little bit on these frameworks and then get back to you with some questions, much more technical questions, maybe. Um, and thank you, Roger, for moderating. Thank you, Eric, Christoph, and everyone joining us for uh, actually more than 90 minutes. So uh, we'd love to also see you in the next open lecture. And for now, uh, I'm saying bye, but uh, we are always in contact in the Discord channel and the next uh, event. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye.